CEO and producer Q Lee passionately paved a new path to introduce Korean popular culture to the foreign audience. His experience and know-how at Sony Pictures Entertainment has helped him cultivate his network with many, including foreign and local celebrities. He has actively taken part in vitalizing the cultural exchanges between Korea and the United States. We will learn more about Q Lee and his achievements on this week's Heart to Heart. Today's guest is an entertainment guru, a very well-connected guy. Uh, please welcome Q Lee, who is the founder and CEO of Kino 33 Entertainment, which specializes in TV and music production. Hello, and thank you for joining us here on Heart to Heart. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yes. Would you like to say hello to our viewers that are watching? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Q Lee. I'm a film and music producer here in Korea and also in the U.S. Um, glad to be on the show. and. Uh, represent for all the Korean Americans out there and everyone out there in the world that's watching Arirang. Thank you. So yeah, there are lots of people watching from all around the globe and I'm so excited to have you on the show. I've got so many Thank questions you. to ask. Uh, but first of all, I mean, introducing uh, you as a producer and CEO of a TV and film and music production company mm -hmm. uh, doesn't do suffice to your career. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, you're a 10 year studio veteran <clears throat> out of Sony Pictures mm -hmm. and you have um, been working very actively in the entertainment arena. Uh, what else? You have recently been making a number of public speaking appearances, you know, helping uh, young people kind of sure. uh, discover their dreams and also follow their dreams. But I am going to have to start off by asking you to tell us a bit about, um, you know, what you're well known for as well. Years and years ago, this was in 2012, I believe. Right. Uh, you actually made it possible for Psy and the Gangnam Style song to become global. You actually brought it to America. So sure. tell us about that a bit. Sure. I, I mean, it's a, it's a whole collaboration of a lot of different people, um, of, of long relationships and, and, and work mm -hmm. that have been put together that kind of made this all kind of organically come into fruition. Um, in 2012, July 15th to be exact, uh, YG Entertainment and Psy uh, released Gangnam Style on YouTube. Um, about 15 days later, a friend of mine named John Nearman called me and said, hey, Scooter and, and the guys were looking at a video, saw this, uh, this guy that doing a horse dance and thought it was the funniest thing in the world mm -hmm. and asked me if I could get a hold of this guy named PSY. PSY. Right, since I was the only guy in Asia at the time. Mm -hmm. I researched it, looked into it. I didn't know who he was personally. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I had asked uh, one of my good friends and older brother figures of mine here in Korea named Yoon Doyeon. And Sai and I met uh, Scooter Braun, who represents Justin Bieber, mm -hmm. wanted to buy the rights to the song. But I thought it would be even better if I could take Psy mm -hmm. to the U.S. and kind of create synergy with Scooter and our Hollywood network so that we can give him a chance to perform in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So Scooter was like, all right, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And then just one thing led to the next. We were on Ellen with Britney Spears. Yeah. And they were on SNL. He uh -huh. was on, he was at the MTV was Movie everywhere. Awards. He was uh -huh. everywhere. And literally, not even two weeks into it, he was a world star. Yes. And that just changed, <laughs> not his life, but my mm. life as well. So at the time you introduced Psy to Scooter Braun, did you have that gut feeling that uh, you know Psy and the song, well, Psy would actually be able to win the hearts and the minds of people around the world and become such a global phenomenon? No, not no? at all while working in Hollywood. Uh -huh. One of my dreams and aspirations was to uh, create a bridge between the U.S. and the Korean market. Mm. Um, in 2004, I watched a film called Taegeukki Hwinyan Yumya, The Brotherhood of War. Uh -huh. And that was the first Korean movie that I ever watched. And I was so um, emotionally bound to that film mm. that I thought it was so great that at the time when I was at Sony Pictures, I was the assistant the chairman of the studio named Jeff Blake. Uh -huh. And I had uh, referred that movie to him so that he could take a look at it. Mm -hmm. And I asked him if there was any possibility that we could release this film in the US. Uh -huh. And so that, that was kind of the start of my passion for Korean mm -hmm. content. So I always wanted to find a way and build a bridge to bring Korean content to the US. 
and then one day be able to collaborate mainstream artists and Korean artists mm -hmm. and see if there could be any kind of synergy. So it was really a lucky toss mm. um, because if, if, if an American person has interest in something like Gangnam Style yes, uh -huh. and be that person's Scooter Braun, mm -hmm. then there's got to be at least a dozen other people that are going to like it just like him. Uh -huh. So I was like, yo, if you're going to take the rights to this song, mm -hmm. I'll make it happen, uh -huh. but I want you to make him uh -huh. something at least or put him on the radio and see what happens. Uh -huh. And that's what he did, and then boom. Now, you were with Sony Pictures for over a little over a decade. Right. Um, and it was the dream company. It was uh, the company Absolutely. That, that, yes. Absolutely. So uh, I'm curious, how did you initially, first of all, get into Sony Pictures? How did, how did you well, begin to work there? I mean, when I, was in, when I was in college, I put together a resume uh -huh. of like all the different companies that I wanted to go to. And I literally wrote a list of about 300 resumes. 300 mm -hmm. resumes. And 300 cover letters. Sony Pictures was a company where they did get my resume, uh -huh. but they just sent me a, a uh, what do you call it? An like, automatic we'll message. You know? Oh. You know, automatic you uh, postcard. Uh -huh. But um, in 2000, uh, 2001, right after I graduated from college, mm -hmm. I took a first trip to LA as an adult mm -hmm. uh, by myself. That weekend was the weekend of the Academy Awards, mm -hmm. and that was March 23rd of 2001. <laughs> uh -huh. I've watched the Oscars, and I'm sure you have too, for forever mm -hmm. on TV mm -hmm. from wherever we lived. But from my standpoint, I was like, well, the Academies are in L.A., uh -huh. and I'm here right now. I just wanted to go check it out because when you watch TV, mm -hmm. you see all the fans and the red carpet. Yeah. They're like, you know, blocks and blocks of fans cheering and hooting and hawing and and whatnot, and I just wanted to experience that because I've never seen that before uh, live. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm gonna go. So I went. And there were cops and FBI and security uh -huh. and all, all kinds of people just all over the block. And I saw a bunch of uh, Asian people there. Mm -hmm. And as the closer I got, I was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's Chow Yun-Fat. Mm. That's Ang Lee, mm -hmm. that's Zhang Ziyi. I was like, oh my goodness. And then I got closer and closer and then these two security guards saw me. You know when a cop drives by, uh -huh. or a cop's kind of sitting out with their radar gone mm -hmm. out and you're driving by? You know, you're just being extra careful? Mm -hmm. That's what happened to me when I saw those two security guards that were guarding that gate. But they took that as me not being able to speak in English. Oh. <laughs> and then they saw them. So they're like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, really? Right. That easy? Just Long story short, that's what happened. Okay. And I literally just walked in because they let me in and I followed Chow Yun Fat and the whole entourage into the Academy Awards and I watched the whole thing. As that progressed from that to the after party, I got a few uh, business cards at, the, at that time through the people that I met. And one of the people there was a gentleman by the name of Paul Smith. Uh -huh. And Paul was the executive vice president of literally, he was the grim reaper of the studio. Mm. He was the guy that fired and hired people at oh, the wow. studio. Uh -huh. And I literally bothered him for like two, three months. And then finally <laughs> he hired me at the company uh, as an assistant uh, wow. in post-production at, at Sony Pictures. And This is how you got to work at Sony Pictures. <laughs> right. But eventually, like you said, you um, worked there for a little over 10 years. Right. Um, you did decide to leave. I so did. What made you decide to leave? I started as an assistant and then and got promoted within, worked for the chairman for five years, and then he promoted me. And then, and then uh, in 2009, he transferred me to Korea to supervise the Korean office oh, I here. See. Uh -huh. So that's how I ended up in Korea in 2009. Mm. But um, I did it for about two years, and I was like, you know what? I'm not loving this job right now. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I ended up quitting. And then fast forward, Gangnam Style happened literally just months right after I quit. Uh -huh. I'd like to ask you to give us an introduction. Uh, tell us about Kino 33 and uh, the work that you do there. So Kino 33 Entertainment is a, is a production company mm -hmm. that I started in, uh, in 2012. Mm -hmm. Rather than my name going up on the credits, uh -huh. I kind of wanted to have a company mm. uh, to, to, to spearhead that and to have like a, like in Korea, to have a sosokgam or, or to have like a, be to, a part to of be a part of right. a, a unit uh -huh. or, a, or a conglomerate or, or something, a, a team. All the different projects I work on that are in TV, film, or music, 
I like to put it under that label. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, rather than my name being first card, I'd rather have my company name go first card. I see. Now let's talk a bit about uh, your work as a film or movie producer. Uh, you produced or co-produced the film Incheon Sangnyukjakjeon, which is known as Operation Chromite, uh, which is a film about a battle of Incheon right. set during the Korean War. You played a major part in having actor Liam Neeson feature in the film. Right. There was a producer here in Korea. Um, he knew me since I was at Sony Pictures since I was a kid. And uh, over the course of the past last five, six years, he would you know, offer me certain side gigs to do, um, to, ha to play a role as an associate producer or a producer on some of the dra TV dramas or, mm -hmm. or films that, I work that he worked on and produced in Korea. And Operation Chromite, Inchan Sang Injection, was, was one of those projects. Mm -hmm. um, we were thinking about different casting options. Mm -hmm. Um, not just the Korean cast and, and the director, but also let's not just get some dude from Itaewon. I see. You know, let's really get someone that's commercial. Uh -huh. We had this dream team list of people from like Colin Firth to mm. Liam Neeson to even John Travolta, Robert uh -huh. De Niro, Tom Cruise. <laughs> I mean, anybody that could fill that role mm -hmm. of, of General MacArthur. Mm -hmm. And the side profile of Liam and the side profile of MacArthur uh -huh. were literally exactly the same. Uh -huh. So I started, you know, digging into my into my Rolodex, like uh -huh. who could I possibly call to get in touch with Liam? Uh -huh. So I asked my boss, hey, I know we have a relationship with Daniel. Uh -huh. Is it possible that we can call his agent and try to get Liam to look at the script of the film that I'm producing? Mm -hmm. And he's like, absolutely. I mean, I can't guarantee he's going to do it, but uh -huh. I have no problem referring you to him. So after that introduction, I got an email from the agent. Mm -hmm. He called me up, and um, it happened. It happened. He's like, I love Korea. I went there for oh, Taken. Wow. Uh -huh. they, they, they received me with open arms, and I would love to go back one day. And so then I took the next flight out to New York to go meet him in New York. Mm -hmm. And we did a little promo reel uh, about you know, his new role. Uh -huh. So when he came to Korea, we could promote the film. Yeah. And then he came here for two weeks. We shot a great two weeks of, of, uh, of footage. Mm -hmm. And um, he was amazing. Yeah. It was like, amazing. Just, I thank him for the rest of my life. <laughs> you also worked on uh, several other projects, just to mention a few. You worked on the 2017 movie, Shin Gwa Hamke, mm -hmm. uh, along with the gods, The Two Worlds. And uh, this past summer, you brokered the US hit series, Criminal Minds, as a remake here in Korea. Right. So yeah, tell us about that as well. Along with the gods, I had a very small part. I mean, I was a yeah. music consultant. Um, I, I was asked to get musical pr publish, publishing rights mm -hmm. and mastering rights for a certain IP from the US so mm. that the film could use those songs as background music for their oh, I see. for their original soundtrack. Mm -hmm. So that was a that was a very small role. I can't take a lot of credit for that. Mm. Um, Criminal Minds uh, was also a production that was done here in Korea as a remake. Mm -hmm. um, Mark Gordon, who's the, the creator of that show in the US, I worked with him when we were doing 2012, a Roland Emmerich film when mm. I was at Sony. And I'd called him and asked him if it was possible to get the option. Mm -hmm. And then he referred me to the ABC and Disney Korea folks, uh -huh. and we brokered that deal, so. But how do you know whether production will do well? I mean, I mean, how do you know? Do you have a special know Well, you know what, it, it, it's, it's really a gamble. Mm. From a producer's standpoint, you always want a good script. Uh -huh. The script is always very important. But then how you package that script is also very important, meaning, mm -hmm. Who's your director? Right. You know, who are the actors? Uh -huh. um, who's distributing? You know, because all that kind of, all that kind of different difference of power is very important. Are you mm -hmm. going to go with this, this distributor or that distributor? And and at the end of the day, what I learned from my boss back in the day at Sony, he was the he was the king of release dates. Uh, you got to get the right release date. Right. And if you don't get the right release date, it doesn't matter how good or bad that movie is. Uh. It will succeed if you if you do it on the right release so date, it is and uh -huh. and if you you make a really good trailer. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say this kind of stuff on TV. <laughs> I hate but, some trailers, but I mean, you know, they're so good. trailers and release dates are very important. Mm -hmm. And and my boss Jeff Blake at the time, he was the king of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's talk right. about more the uh, you know the recent projects, the current projects that you're um, working on right now, films. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, I've been. It's, it's been a long process, but I'm still working on a movie called Blob, mm -hmm. 
The Blob is a, a horror film uh, based on the original classic in 1958 that yeah. Stephen McQueen mm -hmm. debuted in. Um, Richard Saperstein, who's my executive producing partner for this film, had invited me to be on this project. I'm working on another film called Tokyo Undernight. Mm -hmm. um, we're not really at the casting stages yet, but, uh, but Ron Bass, uh, who's a very well-known uh, writer mm -hmm. uh, from Hollywood, he did Entrapment back in the day and a slew of other films mm. that, are, that are all Academy Awardy. Uh -huh. um, he's working on our film right now. Uh, other than that, uh, just working on, on some music projects, uh -huh. um, working on my company, Sonic Tear. Yeah. Um, and uh, we can get into that a little bit later as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can get to it right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're a man who wears many, many hats. Sure. So you are a producer, a great speaker, because as I've mentioned uh, uh -huh. in the beginning, um, you do make, uh, you know, these appearances, mm -hmm. you know. But you are also the senior vice president of Sonic Tear, as you've mentioned. So tell us about Sonic Tear. So Sonic Tear is a sound innovation group. Sound uh, innovation group. We create sound technology to bring you a more immersive sound experience. Uh -huh. So when you're looking at visual, you see 2D, yes. and then you put on the glasses and you see 3D. Uh -huh. Sound, you can do the same thing. There's just two-dimensional mono stereo sound, mm -mm. and then there's 3D immersive sound. Um, Sonic Tear is a company that benchmarked a company like Dolby. Uh -huh. um, we're an algorithm company where we encode, transmit, and decode Film. So it's like when you put, you have a CD, mm -hmm. you put it into the player, it reads the track, and it plays out in the speakers, right? Right. That's what an algorithm is. Uh -huh. And we mix, sound mix content for various Korean films and, and foreign films. Uh, we also create uh, a codec where you can put into a cell phone, tablet, or PC. Uh -huh. So when you watch content, you can hear a more immersive experience. Mm -mm -mm. So we've been working on a lot of different things. Um, we're also talking to TV uh, display companies and whatnot so we can put a codec in theirs mm -hmm. so that when people watch content at home, they can hear a more immersive experience through just not the TV, but also through a sound bar. Yeah. Um, we've also created a, uh, an application called Sonic Play mm -hmm. where, where you, uh, you, can, you can take your own video uh -huh. and then through that application, you can sound mix and, and give immersive oh, experience. That's so cool to wow. your own video that you put up on social media mm -hmm. through binaural technology in your earphones. Right. So all those little different things that we're working on right now is kind of changing the scope of the game and giving consumers more options to bring excitement to yeah. their... To their um, you sent me a link to um, Sonic Tear. Right. And you said, you know, put on your earphones and, mm -hmm. you know, experience it. I actually did try it out. Uh -huh. I couldn't find my small earphones right. and I had these big headsets right. on. It was amazing, the experience. <laughs> it's um, fun, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah. you're uh, set in different environments, in different settings. Right. You have cars passing by, you right. have thunderstorms and right. like lightning. Right. It's so real. Mm -hmm. I actually closed my eyes and it was just an amazing experience. Right. Um, so everyone could actually experience yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, so when you're watching it, watching that in a movie theater, in uh -huh. that kind of technology, yeah. then you really feel immersed in that, mm -hmm. in that, in that situation. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you either feel more for, more emotional yeah. to that scene uh -huh. or more uh, affected by the scene. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you're on a roller coaster ride. Yes. But not. Uh -huh. Yeah. Have you always been interested in like sound mixing or 3D sound technology? Well, you know, working at Sony and, and, and working on all those different films and having the opportunity to study not just marketing distribution but the production aspect uh -huh. of it and then post-production. I was always curious, how come no one did that with sound or never advertised that as much as Mr. Katzenberg was doing 3D visual. Uh -huh. So, you know, in, in 2012, um, a group of our guys mm -hmm. came together and we all kind of clicked and we had the same kind of, you know, aspirations, uh -huh. you know. And uh, we put together this company and eight years running now, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I did say that you are, uh, you know, very busy or involved in the entertainment arena, but you're just about everywhere. Well, very I mean, active. <laughs> it's all inter it's all entertainment based, mm -hmm. be it Kino Thirty Three, yeah, or or Sonic Tear. Sonic Tear. Um, all the contents that I produce, mm -hmm. I have mixed through Sonic Tear. Yes. And any contents that comes through Sonic Tear, mm -hmm. I kind of find a way to collaborate that with mm -hmm. the projects that I'm working on. Yeah. So. It's a, it's a pretty good give and take situation. Mm -hmm. um, nothing clashes, everything's kind of, they all co-work within. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's almost like the same thing. Yeah. Okay.
right now, aside from film and music related work that you do, you do make public, you know, uh, speaking appearances. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to ask you about that. Um, I know uh, there was this talk show that you were on years and years ago and it was just sensational. What are they mainly about and who are your uh, audiences? When, I, when this all first started, I was terrified to be in front of the camera. Really? I was terrified to speak in front of people. Um, I literally, like, I hated it. Uh, when I was in college, I took drama classes because I was so irritated by the fact that I was so bad at speaking in front of people mm. and wanted to win that. I wanted to beat that. Mm -hmm. So I started taking speech and hearing sciences, drama uh -huh. classes, whatnot, to kind of improve my craft and my confidence in front of people. So I think that's why I'm able to speak today. When Gangnam Style happened, it just literally changed my whole mm -hmm. routine. There was a, a show called The Kim Mi Young Show. Uh, yes. They had invited me to be on the show because they wanted me to talk about the happenings of this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And then I actually got a call from The Interview, which is another yeah. Arirang show. Uh -huh. And that was the first show that I actually told my story of how I got into Sony Pictures. That's the first time ever. Then I started to do all these different shows and then all of a sudden uh, this publishing company asked me if I could write a book uh -huh. about my story. Drama. About how uh -huh. um, I got into the industry mm -hmm. and the whole Psy thing and, and, and the future. Mm -hmm. And then the book happened and I titled it Drama which was published in 2013. Mm -hmm. and Drama is an acronym that I put together called DREAM relationship, action, modify, accomplish. Uh -huh. So you make dreams, through those dreams, you build relationships. As those relationships progress, you take action. Mm -hmm. And after you, do, after you take action, sometimes you gotta modify yeah. in order to accomplish. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm blessed. I, I'm still, I still get to do it today. I got one tomorrow. Oh, and really? A few more, and a few more this month, so wow. pretty excited. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, you, you said that you do include, um, you know, in the, uh, public speak that you give, you do talk about how the importance of networking. Mm -hmm. um, and I hear that uh, you pretty much give your phone number to everyone that asks for it. Pretty much, I uh -huh. mean, you know, cause it's just a phone number. I'm not giving them my address or, or <laughs> the, uh, the password to my front door. If you don't give out your phone number uh -huh. or, or you reject somebody, you're, you're losing a golden opportunity mm. that you may, never have known. Uh -huh. You know, growing up, I was, when I was the cool kid on the street mm -hmm. and when I was the loser just trying to grow up, um, I realized that when you're like, when you're an introvert mm -hmm. or you're shy and you don't have enough confidence to, to go up to people, mm -hmm. you're missing out on opportunities. Yeah. And then when you're too cool and you're cool breeze and you're on top of the clouds because you think you're the biggest thing on the planet, mm -hmm. you're also losing opportunities to maintain what you have. Uh -huh. And so when I go to these lectures, yeah, I give my number if they ask for it because just because I'm the guy on the stage, mm. it doesn't mean that I'm the star. I'm also getting a mm -hmm. lot of feedback and inspiration from the people that are out there mm -hmm. in different fields that I've never encountered before. Uh -huh. I was going to ask you about um, what you thought about the importance of networking, mm -hmm. keeping that strong relationship right. between people. Is there anything else that you would like to add or perhaps a message you'd like to deliver to those who want to follow, uh, you know, in your footsteps? Sure. I mean, you know, as a kid, a lot of your elders will tell you, you're never going to make money doing stuff that you like. Uh, yeah. You got to do what you're good at mm. and do something professional. But what's professional? Mm. You know, whatever you're good at, or whatever you're striving to do, that's professional, mm -hmm. I think. Professional is a manner. It's not a skill. Mm -hmm. Professional manner, I think, comes before professional skill. Mm -hmm. If you do what you wanna do right now that you enjoy, and it doesn't work, then you can fall back to the things that you're good at mm -hmm. and recoup. Yeah. If mm -hmm. you don't do it now, you're never gonna get to it. Yeah. So. I would just say to the viewers or to anyone that are trying to follow in similar footsteps of people that they're looking up to, mm -hmm. is to, to, to go and do it and, mm -hmm. and, and see what happens. And if it doesn't work out, then go ahead and do what you're good at. Yeah. But until then, just keep on grinding, mm -hmm. you know, and um, that's all I can really say. I'm still doing it today. I'm yeah. still doing it now. Uh -huh. I still fall on my face all the time. 
<laughs> but you get uh, back up, still get yeah? back up, uh -huh. you know, so I think that's what's important. Mm. This kind of reminds me of uh, what one of our guests, uh, former guests mentioned on a program. He said that his biggest fear was actually not being able to do what he enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm but it was something that he wasn't sure that he was uh, good enough right. to actually start, but right. he actually, you know, gave it a shot and he's enjoying life so much right Absolutely. now. And he's a very, Absolutely. very happy individual. All right, well, thank you so much for sharing thank your you. story. Very unique stories, thank very you. interesting. I guess I could even say it's um, too good to be true stories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a wonderful time. Thanks thank for joining us today on our show. Thanks a lot. Kamzahamida. Kamzahamida.